We're alive. Good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight we are doing Dumodenga. Dumodenga is a libertarian, and he is a very lively analyst of uh, South African economic issues and political philosophy. And he's been running the Man Patriot podcast for some time now, dragging in some of the um, most, most talented young critics of African state domination army. Um, and tonight we're going to be talking to him about his specialty, but also issues and some more historical issues. Um, and we're going to start off with uh, Nodenga's life. Where was he brought up? What influences has he had? Which schools did he go to? That's kind of all of the stuff that makes South Africans what they are generally. So, um, where would you start off, Dumo? Right. Um, thanks for the introduction, Robert. Much appreciated. Uh, always good to um, be here, uh, even though it's the first time I, I'm here. Um, yeah, look, I think, um, where can we start? Look, I mean, I grew up in a... Okay, I was actually born um, when I was, like, very, very young. Um, my, I used to live in Sluma. Uh, it's a small section in a hmm. township called Atleong. So, but I moved there before I could even, sp I moved out of there before I could even speak. So, um, and that was like off, and that was, that was a time when the people's war was still going on. Um, mm. like, so for example, um, you know, there was that whole IFP and ANC battles and everything like that, guys getting shot and whatever. So, yeah, so my dad decided, like, no, gotta, gotta, you gotta go. So he, uh, he got a new job and um, he asked the guys at his work, like, hey, man, I need to find a new place to live at because, hey, the townships are getting rough and I don't know when this is going to end. And, you know, I've got a kid as well and everything like that. So you need to do something. So they helped him get a job. Um, and then, uh, yeah, he moved to Edenville and, I, and that's where I spent like, you know, most of my mm. life, and I'm just you know, now what I'm, I'm 30 now, so I'd say maybe half of my life there. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I went to a school in Edenville. Um, went so I went to, yeah, so I went to school in Edenville, primary school, high school, then last three years of high school, six. I left, uh, moved more into the Johannesburg area, and I went to mm. another school there for three years. Um, very, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a very popular school, but it's, you know, I mean, okay, I'll give you the name. So I went to, a, I went to a high school from 2006. It's not, it's not a high school, it's a private school, um, called Sacred Heart College, right? Uh, it's close to kids. The Sacred Heart. Okay. Yeah. So now. Yeah, no, I went to, I went to any, uh, St. Benedict's for a couple of years. So, uh, I, I understand oh. the whole sort of, uh, Christian high school vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. So yeah, so yeah, we spent three years there, and then um, afterwards I went to uh, studied at Wits. Okay, so for about mm -hmm. for quite a long time. So I did I did my my undergrad, took which, which took three years, and then I did my honors. Then afterwards I did my masters. But when I stood when I did my masters, I was working as well. So I started working from 2013 in a full time job. And uh, yeah, it was um, it was it was cool. I worked at a government company, state-owned company. Uh, I'll just say where I worked because oh, that'll be that'll be an education. That'll be an education. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there you saw things, man. You saw things. Um, but I, I, I have to admit, like when I worked there, it was actually South African Airways where I worked for three years. And when I worked there, I'm not gonna lie, I enjoyed it. The the, the people there were awesome um you know they were they were great i mean like the airline industry is such a challenging industry i'm not gonna lie if i ever become a ceo um and i become a ceo of an airline the first thing i'm going to work out is my compensation deal because i know <laughs> I won't be long, because my word it's so challenging like honestly like it, it's a, it's a, it's too much bro like uh, that's the first thing I'll work. I'll just say, listen, I'll work for you as long as my compensation is like, if you if you fire me under any circumstances, you have to pay me 15 million bucks. That's it. That's it. And then I'll work for you guys. I'll do everything. Um, yeah. And then now I'm working um, 
I'm working somewhere else now. I'm not going to disclose where I work um, for, for obvious Ooh. reasons, of course. Um, yeah, and it's, it's been great. I've been working there for about four years. And um, yeah, that was good. And, and I, I like working there. I'm not going to lie. It's really cool. Um, again, awesome people, awesome company, so forth. And then, um, yeah, then I started the Men Patriot podcast in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. So we're actually two years old now. Shit. No, we're not. Yeah, we are, we are, we're actually two. Damn, I forgot. Like, and, we didn't, we didn't, and I didn't even celebrate. Um, yeah, so was the, and the first podcast was released in like end of October 2018. It was about the EFF. And yeah, and then everything just came on. Everything just went, took off from there. And then I invited you on and other people on and so forth. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> no, man, that's good. Um, so most of you, so most of your life has been spent like really plugged into the institutions. Uh, but your your whole exp your experience of working for SSAA um, made me think of Thomas. He said that the the big wake up moment for him was for a, a government agent. And noticing the inefficiencies that went on, noticing the different ways in which didn't really match up with what he was taught in college about Marxist economics. Right. And um, do you th how how do you think um, how do you think working for SA SAA has influenced your understanding of, um, of economics in South Africa? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I would say. Hmm. How it has influenced me, I realized that, like, I mean, I think one of the, you see, when you, you see, when you're not in business, when you don't see how business is run, and you studied varsity for hmm. a long time, you tend to, you tend to have these ideals of the world, but they don't necessarily work out the way um, you think. So, hmm. for example, um, I thought like businesses would just go out of business when they make losses, but I remember. One person who was working there told me, uh, pretty high up at that time, he's like, listen, the only time you stop a business is when there's no money. You can make losses all you want. As long as you have money to run for op or run the operations, then you're good, you know? That's one thing I realized. So I realized that SAA was in a cash. They were just trying to find ways in which they could just keep their operations running. So you think of it almost as like a... Um, you know, uh, no, I wouldn't say a charity, but you want to like a break even company. Like there's no point in why you're having it, but because it's been there for a long time and people um, depend on it, you just need to find money to keep it running. It's almost like having um, like having a cell phone contract and you're just paying and, um, you know, and someone else is using it. But, you know, you're not using it. No one finds much use in it. But hey, it's, it's still got to get paid for regardless. So. That's, I think that's um, what, what I've seen is that like with these government companies, it's all about, uh, you know, really just where do we find our next sources of cash and to keep the business running? We don't care about profits mm -hmm. because, well, it doesn't make a difference. We can always get a bailout. Yeah, because there's, no there's no incentive. There's no incentive. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, they got the, they've um, always got that back up. They can always just like turn the tap on again. They don't have to patch the holes, they just increase the cash flow. Right. <laughs> exactly that, exactly that. So I think I mean also, I mean, just to add on to what I said with regards to that, I also felt that there's a lot I saw a lot of I wouldn't say there was a lot of it, but I, I could feel that there was some sort of political interference. So now, I mean, you saw what happened with Dutu Mieni now at um, the Zondo Commission and so forth. And, uh, you know, she had some pretty controversial things to say. And, uh, I mean, if you read the newspapers about, like, what was going on in that company. Remember when Tlantlenene said no to the Airbus deal? And then a few days later, mm -hmm. he gets fired by the president. And then, you know, then a new finance minister comes in and he stays there for the weekend. And then Pravin Gordon is the is the finance minister and um you, you you start to see all this nonsense occurring and you're like you can clearly see that there is political interference and then i was just like yeah that, that's that's one thing oh. to, like when one one colleague told me um he said that you know dumo this company went bad when the anc got involved that's what he said and i was like whoa 
So that's what one uh, former colleague told me, and it was um, quite hectic. I'm not going to lie when I heard that. Yeah, no, I mean, I fired Nene because it was all over every newspaper except for the New Age. And I remember very clearly there was a story that they ran, but it made me so angry. They, they, they ran the story. I don't think I've ever been this angry over a news story in my whole life. Um, they ran the story on the front page instead of Nene, where this like little girl, she was nine years old, she was raped, stabbed to death, and dumped in a in a toilet latrine. Right. Oh, that's and they used that to distract from th their their shenanigans in government. And I, I I don't think I've ever been as angry um, over Jeez. over any political issue before, because just for me, the cynicism of that was so dark. I I couldn't think of anything more twisted. It was funny. <laughs> You know, it's funny, like, people remember historical things like where they were for 9-11. I remember where I was when Nene got fired. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Where was I? I don't remember. It was, it was back in 2016, right? I think it was just... Yeah, no, I was, I, I was at this uh, little... Um, there was this awful little cafe. Um, actually, it wasn't all quite nice. They had lots of books there in, in Lower Main in the Observatory in Cape Town. Right. So um, I used to go there because the coffee was cheap. It was run, run it's, it was run by a, I don't know if it's still run by, but it was run by a, like a low level white apparatchik of the ANC um, from Zimbabwe. Oh, and uh, okay. yeah, no, so he tried to keep everything uh, very, very low cost. And I'm not sure how he managed to keep the thing running because pretty much everyone who worked there, even for a week, said like the business model is not really looking all that suave so, but it's just you know trundling on so maybe right. like SAA it's <laughs> but, um, exactly you know as long as you had the cash yeah. I guess <laughs> yeah um, nice guy though. very very nice guy um, but uh, yeah no, no it's We've been looking at yet another bailout recently. That was the big thing in the news for a while. Right. And um, I think at this point, people are starting to look at the priorities in government and see um, that for all of these state-owned enterprises and so on is no longer prestige because they're not very prestigious. Right. And it's not... It sort of struck people, you know, what, what are you, what's the economic rationale behind these things? Right. You know? No, um, it's that it that's the that's actually a good statement because I think um, from what I have seen lately um, with regards to the state of companies, I mean, it's quite clear that they've been used as some sort of vehicle to fund the ANC um, or to um, keep the patronage networks going. That's the that's the reality. I mean, why else would they want to have it? I mean, it's making losses every year. Um, the taxpayer is going to pay for it, but hey, why not um, create some sort of tender worth like 100 million rand to do a mundane activity just to help a fellow, a fellow cater out, you know? So that's basically it. I mean, it's no, it's no different to China. I mean, China, I mm. remember when um, I was reading a book by Frank Dicketer called um, called uh, the, the Tragedy of Liberation, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And the book's right there. Right, right, yeah. And... Uh, what he mentioned was that if you look at um, the China also used cater deployment um, when they took over when the, well when the communists took over in the 1950s they took over the police they took over whatever and they put their caters there and then what they did they just use it to reward people who are loyal to the struggle or well, no let me say to the struggle but to the revolution basically. And mm -hmm. I just think now SAA is nothing different or any other state-owned company, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think we, 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 have, we have a pretty consistent um, sort of communist model going on, but it seems to be a lazy one where they sort of do half the things required to get you there and then just don't go all the way. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, the, the, the model that I see emerging um, is one in which it's almost entirely based on on 
on um, a very, very crude form of image. Right. In which the ANC insists on trying to make everyone dependent on them. So it's it's uh, so I mean a lot of people talk about state capture, but you know, I think one of the uh, one of the sort of uh, people capture is sort of what, what what you can sort of see there because they make the only they they suffocate the free economy and then they make you depend on them for on the unions and on the grants to eat. Mm. Right, right. You know, which is uh, I. I think also, um, just to add to that, I mean, just look at the NHI. Um, mm -hmm. NHI is a perfect example of that because now more people are becoming reliant on the state. The state can now direct specific contracts to specific suppliers for specific items. And okay, I know that's, uh, I use the word specific a lot there, but um, <laughs> I, think, I think everyone gets the deal. Um, and that's the reality is that they need to, they, they can see that there's a lot of money in healthcare. So a lot of people, like especially these um, ANC loving individuals, whenever they listen to the um, the reasoning of Zuelim Kize or before it was actually Aaron Mutsoledi, where he said that um, mm. oh, there's like 17 billion in healthcare that's in savings and that can be used to help the whole population, as if that 17 billion will never run out. And um, and and now I'm just thinking like. It, it, that's not the case. The reason is you are seeing that there's a lot of money there. You want to get your hands on that money and uh, you're trying to find some justifiable reason. So what I did on Facebook the one time, I actually, I actually kind of mocked this idea. So what I did was I put out a status where I said, I said in my area, there's about like um, three petrol stations within, within a 10 kilometer radius. And I said, if I was an ANC cadre wanting to nationalize this thing, I would say that if you look at the concentration of petrol stations within urban areas, it's so many per 10 kilometer radius or whatever. I mean, you, you can figure out a rate. Mm. And then I said, well, now, if you look at the rural areas, there's like one every, I don't know, 150 kilometers. And I'll say, well, that's inequality. We need to equalize that, right? So what you need to do is the government needs to take over uh, uh, nationalize uh, um, all the service stations so that there can be an equal amount of petrol stations within each area. And you know what I mean? It, it, it's such a stupid way of thinking, but th it works. People fall for it. That's the thing. You know, just like, my word, well, why should they stop? You know, so... That's the, that's the sad part. That's what I would say. <laughs> My favorite example of this kind of thinking where you have like, well, more is better, less is better, or same is better. you got like this like, like pixel resolution right. <laughs> model of the universe. And uh, there's this uh, environmentalist um, from the old colonial days who went, you know, mapped Table Mountain. And there's like a little... Right. If you climb up to the blockhouse on the one side, there's like this little like leftover like half a wall from the house that he built there out of stone. There's a really nice, neat stonework, but it's all collapsed now. There's a plaque that someone put up there, and it says, you know, to so and so, I've forgotten his name, um, who came to this mountain, found it barren, and left it covered with trees. Now we all know that, like Cape, T like Table Mountain, and everything is like this very sensitive, delicate ecosystem of like you know Feinbos and stuff. And he covered the thing with flipping pine trees and cork oak and black uh, black wattle. Yeah. If you walk around, there's like little, little patches where these things are growing. Right, if you right. see, find under the pines, there's like nothing growing under the pines. You walk under the cork oak; it's not even grass. It's like barren dry earth under wow. these trees and you're just like it's like what is going through these people's heads they think well uh, trees is uh, green and like <laughs> it's like very it's very doff it's a very doff way of thinking it's i mean i don't know if you've ever read um well, what's it called uh, james scott seeing like a state no haven't read that no a big Recommend. Um, man talks about how uh, the state has regularized simplified models of society in order to run it because it needs to work in a legible environment. And so, in order to control 
whole of our environment it uniforms it because it can only understand things that way yeah that's, that's actually interesting that's actually a uh, yeah but i think yeah i just maybe that's the way human beings do it as well i mean that's how we try to understand the world we try to figure out patterns and and then if it, if anything goes outside of that pattern it's like oh okay something's wrong here or maybe there's an anomaly that would occur anyway without our interference and um yeah i i totally agree with that i mean and 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 I, and I wouldn't see how i won't put it past the government to try and do something of that nature where they try to run it in such a way that they understand it it, it, it can be run so yeah I, I i agree with that i mean i'll definitely read him up yeah yeah i can check you a link um actually I've, I think I've got a, I think I might have, have a, have a PDF lying about, but, um, yeah, I got the, one of the biggest, the sort of cocks up is, is how housing and the ways that, uh, the ways that the government will try and deal with housing, they'll put you into high rises or they'll put you into, uh, like those, you know, you know, there's like those RDP units where it's just like uniform rows of houses as far as the eye can see with like nothing in between, no shops, nothing, just like this barren thing staring at you. Right, right. I had a family member who lived in one. Um, I think she sold it. If I'm not mistaken. I don't know. But it, what I've seen, let me, uh, what, I, what I saw with these RDP houses is that like some people, they renovate them and then they sell them or they renovate them to fit their needs. Like I saw this one guy, he had an RDP house and he turned that into a, a panel beating garage. And I was like, interesting. Very, mm. very interesting. It, 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 and it just shows you really like, when, when, when all these people think there's like a one size fits all for everybody, it, it really isn't that, it really isn't like that. You know, if you give everyone an RDP house, some people are just, live there as you expect them to some would renovate it and some would just turn it into a business and they'll live somewhere else so it's a, mm. <laughs> or, and i've seen yeah, yeah i've seen even um i've even heard of stories where people would just chill there they don't stay there and they make like informal contracts where they just say you can stay here and pay me so much money a month and i'm like, I was like okay cool no problem then i'll just stay at my girlfriend's house or something and then you can chill here and there's no paper, nothing like that. And, and that happens. That, that happens. It's just that it's just that you won't see that on the news because it's gonna like it's gonna give people the impression that oh, okay, it's kind of a scaly thing. But when you actually right there, you see it. It's, it's out there in the open. And yeah, and that's what I saw in the East. Because people, that people a- got to like make their little hustles with the with the system or their needs. Right. right. You know. I mean, I, you, I, I'm sure you know about uh, no cock and his his whole thing of carcinomics. Carcinomics? No. What is yeah, bro. <laughs> oh, I, I think both of us need to, to get on our respective. So he's a white Zulu, mm-hmm. and you know that that that, uh, that very rare breed, and he. So he does he does economic analysis, the informal economy. Economy. And so he's done like a uh, size estimates, um, capital estimates for um, what's it called uh, for like the traditional medicine uh, sector. Uh, he's looked at things like how much people earn f- from selling quarters at the train station and uh, things like that. And I mean, over and over again, he sort of talks about this generic entrepreneurial spirit. And he says everyone's trying to recreate like on Valley they think when they when, when they when they talk. About about uh, entrepreneurship in South Africa. No, no, no. The, m- for most people, the actual money is just doing ordinary delivery of everyday services, and they can make a bank. And she was, uh, he said, um, you know, you get people who say, well, don't you, you talk, talk like a job from the state? Wouldn't you like a job for and so? Wouldn't you like to work in the suburbs or whatever? And say, what? Go work for someone and clean their underwear. I'm turning three grand a month here. Easy. <laughs> you know. Well, it, 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 <laughs> it's like I, I like that. <laughs> I like that. Um, mm. I, I don't know. I, just, I got a thought on that as well because I think also when you talk about gasinomics, um, I think um, 
of course, I mean, the, the townships have their own economies. And, and even in the rural areas as well, it's that the rural areas are a bit more spaced out. And you'll find, let's say, if you go to a small town in the Eastern Cape, a lot of the people there live on farms like outside, right? So what you'll, t what you'll find um, is that people do like make their own things and they do whatever they can to make some cash. And it, it, and it works out. It works out. And then I think what happens now, the government sees this and they think they can try to formalize it. And I'm like, no, don't formalize it. Just let it be. Because now they think that now, oh, we need to put a factory there and a uh, little office there, a little office there. And then now they're like, oh, look, the township economy. Mm -hmm. But they just created a, I don't know, a gussy version of, of Santon, for example. They think it has to replicate yeah. what we see in the formal economy, which I think is which I think is a flawed idea. It's kind of ridiculous because mm -hmm. business owners really want all they really need is a bit of paperwork and registration so they can go to a bank and say, I'm so in such a business. And it's it's just made incredibly difficult. Well, partially by the incompetence of uh of local officials right but i i also th i'm just thinking i also think you know um you know one thing that there is this idea of like the unseen economy um and i think the the whole cosmetics mm. um ideals fits under that and what i've seen is that and this is what is very interesting mm. a lot of the the the, the, the private like institutions private businesses notice that and they've already created some sort of financial solutions for them as well. So, I mean, look, I mean, you, you'll see some fintechs as well. So, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, yes, I'm just trying to see. There's this, there's a, there, there, there are a lot of companies that have noticed this. Like, for example, oh yes, like airtime and data, for example. Now, you, th this is something that you can buy on the app or buy at the Spaza shop or whatever. But now, the person at the Spaza shop um they don't like sophisticated connections and stuff or or whatever so what will happen is that sometimes this guy will he will he'll be registered for like some um app or something where you could actually uh sell um airtime so the guy will come to him and say hey i want um 50 rand mtn okay not that mtn is associated with this podcast and then you know he will say okay no problem he um sells he goes on to this little platform on his phone and he buys that airtime and then he puts in the cell phone number and boom, it's there. So what has happened is that a lot of like these, um, uh, well, I mean, I've seen it a lot in the finance industry where they, they, they're entering these economies and they're trying to create solutions to make either the, their um, service provision much faster and also making payments much easier as well. And, and, and you know what they do? They don't try to change. They just say, oh, this is what happens. Oh, it's taking a bit too long. Okay, we can make it faster. And they give them, and they throw an incentive on top of that. Mm. And I, I think for me, that's, um, that's the way it should be. That's, the, that, that's what I think is, um, is key. And then also, there may be some situations where a, a lot of these large retail brands are entering the the Kasi, for example, in the township, or Ekasi, for example, mm -hmm. they're entering there, and then they're opening their own spaza shops there. And I remember this was a very controversial topic because a lot of people were saying, oh, well, this guy, he worked so hard to build this spaza shop, and now, now you've got um, pick and pay opening their own mini spaza shop there as well. And I mm -hmm. was like, well, but guys, that's, that's, that's how opportunity works. And also at the same time, um, you know, I wouldn't see it as a bad thing because, I mean, like, if I, if I owned a spaza shop and then, you know, pick and pay offered me a franchising opportunity, I'd be like, okay, let, let's see what you got. You know, what can I sell to these guys, you know? So, I, I mean, I think for me, it's, it's, it's really nice to see how this place is developed, how the, how the townships are developing on their own terms. And I, I'm really impressed mm -hmm. with it. And, and, I, and I really think that the government should just take a step back. Yeah, because I one of the things that um, that uh, Gigi Orcock was bringing up is how um, 
All of the metrics that the government uses to actually keep track of the economy are incredibly far off. And he says that, um, well, when he was making the measurement like a couple of years ago, he was using uh, the quality of life instruments to measure um, the private market through surveys and stuff, like whether you own a toaster and all that kind of stuff. And he said he reckoned that more than half of the country actually live at a middle class standard of living. Right. Or higher. Um, it was I that, but I can't remember to say number now. I, I, I would agree with that because I've seen a lot of improvements in living standards in the township over time, um, especially through Stockfells. Stockfells have been like, mm. they've been, they are like they are brilliant, and I'm, I mean, I, I'm you know where I work now. Um, I know some. I have some colleagues that have their own stock fells, and um, what I found interesting is that, you know, if you if you just get a, a group of committed people, and just let them contribute, and you take turns in using money, it's it's crazy what you can do, right? And I mean, I've seen people like renovate their houses as a result. Um, I've seen them, you know, like the houses look good like brilliant stuff and, and and all because of those ideas i mean the stock fell idea i don't know if it's practiced anywhere around the world i really don't know i really don't know but it's a blooming good idea did the anc come up with it no they didn't mm. it, it was it was people that live in the townships that that, that they they realized their living conditions and they said listen let's let's do something let's put money away and then every then every month you you get a thousand or something like that it's a brilliant idea. It, it, it works and people benefit. Like, I mean, just imagine, I mean, you know, you need to get your house renovated and your house looked like it was one, you know, one, um, one windstorm away from falling over, you know? And then, you know, you, you put, just because you put like, let's say 60 bucks in a stock fill, then it's your turn and then boom, it, it, it's brilliant. I'm not gonna lie, brilliant innovation. And people should take advantage of it. I mean, if, if, especially if you're like, uh, I mean, I, I think Stockfield should probably be recognized as some juristic person, really. That's what I would say. And the government could make some. Yeah, but legal personhood, then. Yeah, oh, I don't know about that. I like keeping it, or I would, I would like to keep her away from private. Uh, pri these things are. Right. But that's what's. You, know, you worry about when the government gets yeah. involved in financial. You know, then the bureaucracy starts growing. You know? Right. But, um, <laughs> but, that's what's gonna happen, but it's funny you say that the West, yeah, sorry? No, no, continue, gonna continue. Say the West, yeah, yeah. Like, no, no, it's a continue, uh, sorry. I, I was going to say, I was going to say, there are, there are similar things. In the West, you get uh, things called credit unions, but right. they're more, they're more, um, like, involved, and they, they make, they're, they're, they're making because the government's gotten involved. And now there's regulations and have been for generations now. Um, but people prefer to go to banks because banks have that trustworthy thing. And there was a big thing in the 90s when a whole bunch of them went bust. And, uh, so, right. savings and loan, and everyone gets involved in these f the, the, the lower end of the financial economy. There's, there's just the trust issue grew too big, uh, grew too bad after a few headlines. Mm -hmm. You know. Right, and and, um, and I'm just I'm just I'm just thinking about. I mean, I remember when I was still in varsity, which was a long time ago. Um, when I was doing my honors, which was again a long time ago, like I feel old now. That is like eight years ago. Hey, sure. Anyway, so um, <laughs> <laughs> there's this one article that I read, that uh, academic article, and again, it must have been written like in 2005 or something. Again, that's I can't believe that's your. Know, but, okay, so now that's so what there's, there's a, the author, I think it's Prahalad. I think I, I hope I pronounce it correctly. And he was talking about the bottom of the pyramid. And he was talking about how the if, if, if companies try to serve the bottom of the pyramid, um, they could actually make some money through economies of scale. All right. And what has happened is that you yes. want to access the bottom. Of, okay, the bottom of the pyramid. So, okay, for the viewers who are watching, by the bottom of the pyramid, I'm just talking about, again, it's like a pyramid. The guys at the very top, you make money out of them by through high-value transactions, and the transactions are obviously, um, they, they're much higher than the middle of the pyramid. Pyramid, more transaction, less. 
more transactions and average transaction values lower. And then at the bottom, the transaction values are so low, but you make them up through economies of scale. So the whole idea there is that you have to create products for that, um, for that base. The problem now is that companies mm-hmm. don't want to do it because it's, it, it requires so much. It's, it's, think of, I mean, if you want to sell, let's say, something to someone, you can just easily go online and sell it. That'll be a, that'll middle, that'll be a middle class person. But then if you want to go sell something, let's say, to someone who's at the bottom of the pyramid, he may not have access to a computer. And if he wants to do anything on his cell phone, he probably has, mm-hmm. he probably uses USSD or something like that, which is the star, whatever, what a hash, hash and then it throws up some menu, right? Or for example, when he makes his food, um, he may not make it on a, you know, on, 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 a, on, a, on a simple stove. You know, he may make it somewhere else, how he sleeps. His whole lifestyle may be so fundamentally different to what you what you may perceive as a marketer or whatever and getting and doing research on that requires a lot of time and effort and now the problem here's the problem if you are a company chasing money the time that you spend researching could and the resource that you're spending researching you could be using it to do something else releasing another product on the market and then competitors take over so it, it, you, you know you're stuck in that dilemma right so I, I think so. Yeah. What Prahlad was saying is that you have to invest, and this now it's happening in South Africa, which I'm happy with. Should have happened a long time ago, but it works out. It really does work out because when you target these individuals for specific products based on how they live, because because they they may be low income earners. Not all of them are low income earners, but you can actually improve their life with the very little they have because mm. of that. And, and people don't see it. They, 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 you got these socialists who think that everybody should have like a, a five bedroom house living in Santon and they should be able to go to the mall every Saturday because, because the socialists, that's where they live. And that's how they think everybody's life should be. But it's not like that, man. It's like people can still have a good life without living in Santon. I mean, okay. Going like, if you go like to let's say um Eastern Cape, you go to like Port Alfred and then you go to the farm areas there. Some of these guys are like earning mm. two thousand bucks a month. They're living the life, bro. Their lives are simple. Well, I mean because actually the, 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 the price of the, the cost of living down there in the south of the country is actually a lot is a lot lower in, in, in many ways, isn't it? Man, even the beer is cheap. I don't drink beer, I was buying beer for my for my cousin. And I remember <laughs> Oh, now if my folks hear this, they're gonna they're gonna go back. But anyway, um, <laughs> 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 and I was so shocked how cheap it was. I was like, oh my goodness! I'm like, okay, let's buy two six packs. And then, <laughs> but I didn't drink any of it, right? But it was so damn cheap. And the, the the thing about it, and also the thing about it as well, is that the guys that are living there, the farm workers that are there, they shop. You know, I mean, I see where they live, everything, simple life. You know, no one's complaining about, oh, I don't have this, I don't have that. When they go watch a football game, they go to town and they watch it at the pub there and then they go home, you know. It's so simple. Yeah. Like, I I know that life a little bit from uh, from out in Northwest Province and um, it's it's funny how people don't – they don't seem to notice their conditions really. It's just sort of the water they're swimming in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only people who seem to notice are the people who drink too much, and uh, they're always scrabbling for coins. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and then there's the occasional person who's like really ambitious, and they're like, you know, um, no, like they want to learn English and they want to get to the city and they want to get a future and all of that. Most right, people right. just sort of cruising speed, you know? Yeah, Because exactly. there is money to be made in those rural townships. Right, right. I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. It's just that no one goes out there and actually does some basic research. Like, so sometimes what I will do, right? You, you want to say something? You wanna... no, 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 no. I'm just getting oxygen into the brain. <laughs> <laughs> See, 
hey, don't faint on me, man. Don't faint, man. You're having a good time. <laughs> no, I got, I got to breathe carefully so I don't, you know. <laughs> I see, I see, I see. <laughs> So sometimes, yeah. like, I'll, I'll take, like, like, you know, like, when I go to the Eastern Cape sometimes, what I'll do, like, in the farm areas there, we'll just drive around. And then we'll just go to some farms here and there. And, you know, when, you, when they just drive around and they're showing you stuff, it's, it's a great chance to observe what's actually going on, how people are living, what they actually do, what they, what they depend on, and stuff like mm. that. And what and you know and, and it's and the nice thing about it is that it you only see it when you're not actively looking for it, because when you're actively looking for it, you it's like it it, it, it it I don't know for some reason when you I don't know I had a remote the one time that I thought I lost, and while I was cleaning my house I found it. It's like that. It's 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 it's, it's that's exactly how it is. It's that you know you're just having a good time. You just oh look at this, look at that, look at that, and then you observe these things and then. And then you say, oh, okay, wow, okay, these guys actually do this. They do that. They do that. And that's when you see it. That's when you actually see how they live. Um, I saw one of the mayors. The mayor, again, he doesn't live in like some big fancy house that there. You know how you identify the mayor's house? By the car he drives. That's it. And his car wasn't even like a Merc. It was like a, like a Hilux, but a very new one. You know what I'm saying? But you could see... Okay. The, to the to the to the um compared to the overall community surrounding it yeah they're probably driving like older rusty uh, more characterful they don't even drive cars <laughs> they don't they actually you know they walk no no that, they walk no. some of them yeah and it's so, and, and, that, yeah, and that's no. the thing Dude, you're making me think of do you, you've ever drunk like Kokwe or any other brand of tea or something there's if you look at a, a like like a white person's beer, it says "Don't drink and drive." If you look at Clockway, right, right. it'll say "Don't drink and walk next to the road." <laughs> <laughs> there we go. They know they target markets. There we go. That that that's their target market. You see, but 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 you see yeah. what I'm saying, Rob? Like, do you do you see how the private institutions they know more about these communities than the government because they literally convince them to spend they their have money to, on or they go out of business exactly there we go there <laughs> we go so th this is th th that's the thing you know like it, it, you know the the rural economy township economy it's you know it's 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 one of the most amazing things and i think there's a lot of potential there in my opinion i don't think you need to urbanize the damn thing no you don't i mean you'll find that no i mean mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but think think how depraved life is in the city. I mean, look, you you have family in the Eastern Cape, and you visit them every so often. I assume uh, the the difference in lifestyle, the difference in the character of people, and the just when you meet, like you know, when you're in the city, someone who's in from the country, you know them like in a second. Doesn't matter what race they are, you know they're from the country because they're polite. <laughs> and they're and they're personable, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're trusting, and just like there's a whole, it's like a whole spirit. The whole vibe when they walk into the room, you can just tell it. You know, the city yeah. really screws with you. Like it raises all of that sort of like cultural upbringing. It raises um, all of that person community. You know, that's right, right. Um, but again, that's because because there isn't like you see in the city because there's a lot of competition and stuff like that. You can't really, you know, take a you can't really sit on the back seat because if you do, you're gonna get left mm. behind. Okay, now I'm passing for it's just yeah. like you. Um, <laughs> you're gonna be left behind, and yeah. then um, so in the in in the in the rural areas, it, it's it's much simpler. Um, there's a guy that was on my podcast, Tumisani Kili, for example. Um, and he lived, mm. he, he went to a rural school, everything like that. And, um, you know, he moved to the city later on. And, you know, and, and even from his experience as well, like, um, I mean, he was earning about, if I'm not mistaken, about, he said that him and his brother, they were earning a combined salary of 600 rand a month. And um, they were working at a tavern. Right, and they, and it got them through. Hey, it got them through. 
And, and, and that's the thing, because why the lives they live, it, look, think about it this way. It's not like they have to go home and watch a DSTV. I mean, chances are they probably have a TV, but it's got SABC 1, 2, and 3. Or mm. if they have DSTV, it's compact. Um, you know, they've got a microwave. They've got a fridge. And what, what, what's in that fridge? It's not what's in my fridge. So, I mean, even, even if you... And that was very interesting. When I went to the Eastern Cape... And I started, no, you, you, you keep that bare bones thing where you have the soy mints and the pop... And then you have some, then some sashabo ingredients. If you're having anything more like milk and tea, then that's like you know, very exactly. special. Oh well, yeah, okay. So <laughs> or well, like, well, like, a can, like you get a can of bully beef, and like we're not things that much is for today's yeah, yeah. meal, and that much. very different mindset, you know. Right, and one thing I've also realized is. Um, long life milk. I, I I never bought long life milk in my life, but every time I go to the mm. rural areas, almost every house has got long life milk. And there's a specific brand. I forgot the name of the brand. There's a specific brand. And they have these little white cartons, like this it's size. Green one. Um, I don't know, but it, oh, oh, oh yes, no, um, no, no, no. I forgot the name. It's actually white. It's a little white carton, like this. But it, I mean, literally. I mean, if you if you if you if you eat a lot of cornflakes and stuff, that thing can one cotton is not enough. But I, I've noticed that as well. And also, where they where people buy their groceries as well, it's different. The setting is different. You go to like um, there's this, there's this place in the Eastern Cape um called Vigisville. Vigisville, it's uh it's like this wholesale store, right? Um, everybody who lives in the rural areas of the Eastern Cape will know Vigisville. If you don't know Vigisville, Vigisville, then um yeah. Then you know that. Then they know that you haven't been there. You haven't grown up there. But it's a it's a very very um, well. I don't know if it's still there. Flip. It's been a while. But it should be there. I don't see why not. But it's a very very well established place. It's a wholesale thing. That's where you buy the groceries. Everything. My grandfather would buy groceries there, and stuff. Even like my pop sometimes. Like when um, guys need groceries, they just go to Vigisville and then they just get everything there. Um, the only problem is that, guess what? They mainly deal in cash. That was the last time I went there. That's the problem I have, is that it's cash. No card payments. Mm. And then it, if you want to... But they we don't like ATM. cash. Huh? Yeah, you know, they, they, maybe it's because of living in Joburg, but like the if, if I feel like I have a lot of cash on me, mm. I feel like like I'm just like a magnet. Like these robbers, they know that you've just got a lot of cash. Yes. And they, they always... Haven't oh, you noticed? Well, you know what they're going to they do you now, hey? What? What? What are they? What are they gonna do? Yeah, they're like they'll pick you up and they'll drive you to the ATM and then they make they watch you while you put in your code and everything and oh my they just take everything somewhere. Oh my goodness. yeah, you, you see what I mean? Like they're just getting more and more clever, you know. But I don't know. I haven't been there. I maybe I should. I think if I go there, I'll just actually um go to Bridgesville again and check how it's doing. But um, again, it's a it's, it's a pretty nice establishment. People buy from there, and even the way the goods are packaged as well, it's not the same as the cities. It's it's they packaged in, in in bulk. So because remember, a lot of people live very far. It's not like, for example, like I can just run to the oh, garage. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, I'm gonna have milk. <sighs> run run into the garage, you know, and then I can come back. But them, it's like. <laughs> Oh, you forgot to buy milk, and then they'll hit you like you idiot. Now you have to make another trip, and it's a long thing. So, and you find that a lot of the items that they sold they are in bulk because of that. Because people, because again, people don't mm. have time because traveling takes time, right? And not people, and not many people have time. So even that is um, another aspect. It's interesting. Yeah, no, I, when I was in Northwest, when I was in Northwest, I had to. You, th like the buses would never stop where I lived, so you had to like get lucky and you catch you catch a hitch with someone got got a bucky, and sometimes they'll just like ask for money, um, like but like the the price can be anything because if they think that you're a German, to uh, one of the Germans, because there was a you get like those like uh, it's always Germans, um, you get you know people to come help out deepest darkest Africa, you know. <laughs> and um so you you get on the back and they think ah you know white boys are german and then they'll say like 50 rand 
And I'm like, yeah, uh-uh, exactly. Butchie, don't touch me with that shit. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but, you know, going to, if anyone wants to wants to do this on the map for fun, um, from from Skansdruf to Zierst. Now, Skansdruf, if you Google it, you're not even going to find the building. You find a primary school that's, like, way down the road. It's, like, not <laughs> even a real place. And, you, you like, you have to catch a hit, and then you have to get off. And catch another one if a person isn't going to zerist. Um, it's right. and you have to get lucky. You have to get lucky, and you catch the taxi back, and you're sitting there with like bags of shit. <laughs> and if you're feeling hungry, and you go to those corner shops, and I don't know if you've right. had this experience, like the little, little, you know, the little ones which have like the little shelter, and there's and there's some woman, middle-aged woman, who's sitting there with that like. Uh, Right, and like a plate of food there, and I'll say, like, you know, there's like a standard rate, and then she just keeps heaping the food on there, and you think, how are you making? Yeah, uh, are you? <laughs> and it's like, I'm looking at a plate that's like this. Yeah, the, it's like a mount. It's like a mini mountain, it's like an ant hill. It's an ant hill of food. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know that. I, I know, I, I've people been are that. Yeah, that's another thing. They're generous as well, eh? Like. Like I remember, um, every time I'd visit, like, like, like my grandmother would always like give us some money, but not like, like you know, like you know, back in the day, she would give us like a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks every time we like visit and and would leave. She'd give us money. Like even my grandfather would put money on top of that as well. But then you know, I never saw that money because my parents took it all. But it's okay. Um, I'll forgive them for that. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't trust your decision, uh, decision making uh, skills. Bruh, like, come on, man. Like, they should have at least said that, you know? They should have at least it, it, let me spend it the way I want. Um, but it's fine. Um, yeah, no. Do you, I, know, do you know what that makes me think of? What? <laughs> is I was reading a book a while. Um, it was a... I'm trying to remember his name. It's like uh, something Williams. Okay. And he wrote this book called Chieftaincy, State, and Democracy. And it's like this fairly... Like... Fat for an academic volume for a book, you know. Um, and it's like the study we did, like traditional communities there in that area, like in in the south of KZN and the um, and the north uh, and the sort of like eastern bit of eastern. And, mm-hmm. and uh, he was looking at how they understand traditional authorities, and there was one principle that is that democracy is not a not something that like maps onto it very well, but there's like a principle of cons- consultation be consulted and and like that thing seems to touch everything in south africa people are okay with to the ballot box and anything but they want to be consulted you know and so i was thinking you know your 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 parents didn't consult you (laughs) right on the Uh, money thing okay sorry i'm just looking at the comments they said my, my volume is low let me just guys i'll fix my volume give me two seconds all right, this should be better. This should be better. All right. Um. Okay. Yeah, that's a little beefier. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. Viewers, just let me know. Um. Okay. So, yeah, man. Um. Democracy. Democracy. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's. Uh, I'm also having problems with democracy now, but. Yeah, it may not be useful to us Africans. Not because us Africans can't think. It's just that. We need to think of our own our own solutions. That's what I would say. It's very interesting. It's interesting you say that. Um, I've been I've been chatting recently to someone who works in Nelson Mandela Bay, and um, that municipality. What they did is they um, they've been doing in order to draw up policies and performance indicators and stuff like that. They went into they went to the communities and did this enormous right. like uh, workshop thing where they drew out issues that the, 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 that the community had, and it was very very participative, which I right. like. Uh, which I tend I, I like a lot. I like that kind of like focused pro- problem solving stuff. That very sort of more pragmatic less right. way of going about things. I mean, it's still very oriented, but um, it's a lot better than pick a party and let them design a top-down thing for you. 
Right, right. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, I don't know what I can say to that, man. <laughs> Except I agree. <laughs> Oh, good. Um, well, one of the things that came out of uh, traditional institutions that, that that I was reading in that book that uh, the me is very is the, the the traditional role of traditional authorities. One of them is allocating land to people, mm-hmm. right? And so, pre-modern South Africa, you know, a hundred odd years ago, you got like what ten people across. A land that's like three times the size of Germany, right? So plenty of space for everyone to like gamble about and like hoy down a plot of. Blood. And now things are about but more enclosed. Um, and it seems interesting to me that that that, that right that sort of uh, right to, to to have somewhere to settle uh, is not something that's been enshrined in the Freedom Charter. Mm-hmm. And so that that um, sort of understanding of private property and um, and settlement. How how do you think the general understanding is? How ingrained is that particular understanding usage in uh, in, tradi- in 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 African society? Right. Okay. So for me, uh, I'm looking from the outside in. So I've, um, mm. so I didn't grow up in those. Oh, yeah, because you've been very well. You've been very westernized. Exactly. But. I have made some observations and my observations have led me to yes. some conclusions. <laughs> All right. So um, I think the, the whole idea is that when, okay, before, from what I understand, uh, the chiefs would allocate land. And of mm. course, now the thing is that um, a lot of these lands that are allocated by the chief, obviously you can't take out a loan based on it. It's not an asset uh, because it's not recognized. And, um, but what I've noticed is the easy transfer of it as well. And, but the problem is that you see, because the land can be easily transferred and there's no record keeping, there's a lot of, um, information gaps. So you'll find, uh, for example, um, in my family in particular, so there is a particular place where, um, my grandfather and my, and my father and so forth grew, grew up and, um, that land was given to them by someone else, not particularly a chief. And then when we're trying to dig into what actually happened, getting that information was very difficult because the people that were around at that particular point in time were either not alive or if they were alive, you know, speaking to old people is not the best thing to get information out of them because it happened so long ago. And that's the one thing that kind of was frustrating was the record keeping. That is what um was um the issue so uh, again for so from my observations it seems to me that like you know people know like okay this is where dumo stays this is where rob stays and stuff like that um and then and 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 it's kind of spaced out but at the same time you know i can if i just get sick and tired of this and then just say hey man you just live here and then you know then they'll say, oh, so-and-so stays here. So I don't know how the chief gets involved particularly, but sometimes the chief does get involved, but probably when it comes to disputes and stuff like that. Now, going back to the Freedom Charter, remember, uh, when was the Freedom Charter drawn up? Just to... 55. 1955. So that was like after... Was, okay, was, was that, that's after Salt Blanky, right? I'm just trying to see... Um, oh, yes. so, so Plyke is very early 20th century guy. He didn't make it to the Second World War as far as I remember. He didn't, right. So I'm pretty sure, I mean, because I, I, when, when, the, when the Land Act came into being, so Plyke went, uh, the, the, went to Britain and, you know, told the, the royalties about what was happening, right? So I think... Even with him, I mean, he was also kind of, I mean, like, even if you look at his hairstyle as well, I mean, you could say it was westernized as well. Um, and mm. uh, he, um, you know, I think he was um, a big fan of private property rights. You know, he wanted um, black people to own land just as white people did and, you know, having that free trade and so forth. So I think, I, I think for me, you know, I think people kind of underestimate the 
the what you call it the influence that the west has on africa and you can actually see it like like when you look at old photos of of of, of black people um like so blacky mm. and stuff i mean the, the, like well there's like, like really old, nazi tweet suits exactly like it, it's 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 you know i mean i'm pretty sure they were as cultural as they could be within their own communities but when they like when they were like um in photos and presented to the outside world it was those wearing the way they wore suits and and so forth so i think yeah i think in my opinion um i, I think i don't have a problem with these traditional organizations of land because i haven't seen disputes with regards to that like for me it, it seems life seems to be peaceful there mm. right um what yeah, i would, yeah. what i would rather say is just that um people do tend to have a bit of difficulties so for example if they want to start a farm there and it's doing very well and they want to take out a loan but they don't have land that's where that's when it becomes an issue and because there is yeah. no collateral so that's the, that's the major Make one observations I mean, it's like the whole enclosure enclosure movement in england which of course was quite nasty it involved a lot of land dispossession and there was a lot of corruption there right i mean uh i know some of my scottish ancestors were displaced during the enclosure enclosures but um it's it's, it's one of those things where once you get to a certain population density, like like you see around the big cities and the towns and so on, then that land dispute stuff become an issue. And right. uh, yeah. it's 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 fun because you you you'll you'll see a lot of attempts to combat this, uh, you know, slum clearances and so on in Europe going back centuries. And when the Great Fire of London happened, there was every bureaucrat tried to scramble to right, replace right. London with a nice methodically produced city and uh everyone before they managed to get the the, the plans through parliament <laughs> the yeah. all the people built their houses back exactly where they were and so the only building that they could get away with building was the was the cathedral St. Paul's cathedral <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh shame right yeah man it's uh, but, it's, it's interesting yeah, no, it's it's. I think it's one of those things where you've you've got an organic way of life that the the that's sort of natural to human beings, right? And and I think we're living in a time now where we're we're looking at big nasty things called cities that have millions of people in them, which right. sort of borders on the natural. And uh, yeah, I. But they still obey the laws of supply and demand that any other system ever did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're, we're, we're sort of stuck there. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, again, guy looking from the outside in, um, mm. when it comes to rural areas, I think um, also there as well, it is, there are some like spaced out developments. So... There are city centers, but very small city centers. Like it'll have like mm. a police station and uh, you know, post office and home affairs office as well. And um a driving station. Yeah. Rural <laughs> home affairs offices. <laughs> and a, a few shops There's here. Nothing like a rural you know. home affairs office. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes they have to go to town town, like you know, so there's like town yeah. and then which is which is not too far then there's town town which is like let's say an hour's drive away yeah with yes. right? so it, it's 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 like that as well you know so i think um you know it, it's again the life is different and because the life is different they have different needs and i think that's where um i think that's in my opinion is just where where we kind of miss it a little bit is that uh we just forget what concerns them because probably what concerns us is not what concerns them because like for us it's time because our jobs can be so demanding we may not have time to you know do the washing for example right so even with me you know i mean i'm working all the time and i just get someone else to do my washing you know and maybe for them they they have time to do the washing because it makes them uh oh, a bit uh i don't know 
it's it's maybe it's a relaxing exercise. I don't know, right? No, um, no, no, no. When you when you're in that position, you're doing the laundry because you don't have someone to do the laundry for you. Oh, you'll be surprised, there. You can uh, get people, eh? You can get people, eh? Like you can get no, people. I, I know you can get people. You get some interesting offers in exchange for those services. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, um, yeah. I had. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when I go to the rural areas and I'll see, sometimes there'll be that one lady who comes and does the washing, and then we pay her. Like, oh, cool. Mm. You know, and then I was like, yeah, like why don't you just do that? Just call her; she can do our washing. I'm like, no, you got third lazy. I'm like, hey, I got money. I don't care if she wants to do my washing. Here it is. Here's my clothes. Just wash them, hang them, and iron them. I'll be happy. You know, and there are people willing to do that. <laughs> I had a yeah. Uh, I had some funny. Uh, I I didn't have anyone who who offered to wash my wash my clothes and cook for me for money. Right. Exactly. But um, yeah. So the, the those those ones are very awkward. Got to be very polite because <laughs> transactional <laughs> relationships are, are not my are not my vibe at all. <laughs> um, no, but uh, ugh, no, I I. I I like the slow pace of things there. I mean, the, 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 I, I just, some of the things though that struck me that were really weird were some of like the little things, the little artifacts. And this is like, this is Tona culture up there in Northwest by Mariko, right? No. The, my favorite is watching the clash of Germans because the under, misunderstandings are fantastic. So, you, um, so this is a tiny thing. It's kind of insignificant. But you know how, like, right. English people count one, two, three? No? Right. And I don't know if it's all over the country, but in Northwest, it goes one, two, three, four, five. And then, well, then it's six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. In Germany, this is three. Let's see. Oh, I couldn't. So you oh, get this thing. Yeah. So, so then, yeah. So, so then, what you do is you get you get like a German to the bar and say three three Zamalek, and the guy's like, "Huh? Eh, eh, I got I got you. I saw I saw the hand symbol. What are you getting? He's getting eight exactly. And then you get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see. <laughs> or the or, or no, like no. you know how you know everyone like likes to shake the hand very sort of gently and politely in the countryside and then a german will come and give you like like one of the vice grip right. sort of numbers you know that's one thing that i realized as well i remember um yeah someone i remember this one guy I shook my hand he's like bro you gotta have a your handshake's gonna be firm because if your handshake is weak um it's you're not gonna look good <laughs> And then when I'd go back, and then when I'd no, go you're not. Other relatives, um, and I'd shake their hands. I'd shake them like really hard, and I'd run out and I was like, "Oh my goodness!" And then I could see that that idea of a handshake, especially among um, the guys in the rural areas, it's different. But me, it was like a firm one, but not like one where you like you know you shake the whole arm off, but just one where it's pretty firm. But oh I've no, it's a not a Trump them. handshake. It's just a. <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly but then when i meet um guys that are more westernized and then i shake their hands their handshakes are much more firm and that's what i noticed as well it's like hmm, that's a that's an interesting thing my favorite my favorite my favorite variation of this one is where you meet that wife he'll he'll shake your hand and then he'll start a conversation and he keeps holding your hand and so you have right. this handshake that's now this is like five <laughs> minutes what the hell's going on here or the one that the one that I didn't understand for the longest time, I it took me ages to get what was going on. Would be a guy who will shake your hand and then he'll kiss your hand, and I was like, "What the hell are you doing? Is yeah. this some bop shit?" No, apparently, <laughs> apparently that's another vibe that I was not expecting. <laughs> you see, look at that. This is like not picking up the clues. It's like okay, this guy's just a little bit obsequious. It's not um, yes, weird. Yes. And then yeah. there's like, and, and then you notice the eye contact. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, here we are. Um, so how your 
handshake like the, in 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 the world there's one handshake that you have for business there's a handshake you have for like friends where you got like bump chests everything you know yes yes but but i was like that the uncle handshake where they sit talking to you for five minutes i don't get that one that <laughs> one i do not get i don't understand yeah. that you met this time i've met you and now i'm holding hands with you longer than i usually do with my girlfriend what's going on <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, man, that's, uh, that's pretty much it man <laughs> That's what happens. Oh fuck! Cultural differences. Oh no! What? Oh, dude, the worst one is Joe. Like, every flipping time, Joe Burger, they've got a new, new fucking combo going on. <laughs> There's what? Yeah, what I is it? Do you remember? Do you remember when there was that thing where the? You remember the one where where you've got to snap the fingers? You yes, you do this and then you snap. Like yeah, yeah, I know that one. I know that one. Yeah, mm. I used to do that. But now yes, it's, I didn't, it's not. Like I didn't that. get that. One. <laughs> That one didn't happen. It, it just didn't. It didn't click for me. <laughs> that was like when. That was like 2005, around that time, and then it just died mm. out. Afterwards. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, but uh, speaking of handshakes, we must. Uh, back. Um, oh, it's been lovely. It's been lovely chatting to you, Dumo. Um, I know we do much into uh, into any sort of. Uh, major cultural issues yeah. but uh i was really happy to talk about the uh the free market aspects of south africa which is as you know relatively untouched by most so right 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 yeah. okay man it was great well, man thanks for having me on man excellent man good night everybody good cool cheers <laughs>